morning. Turn to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew, chapter number 1. We'll start reading in verse number 18. The Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise. When his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, being interpreted, is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bid him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, in his name, and he called him, or his name, Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us. And pray, dear Lord, that you would settle my heart this morning and that uh, you would help me to be able to be focused on your word. And dear Lord, give me the unction and power on high that I need to preach this morning. I pray for each person here, dear God, that we would settle our hearts and minds. We would forget about every person around us. And dear Lord, that we would focus our time on you this morning. May we rejoice in the glories that we find in your word. And may, dear God, they transform our lives. And that, Lord, you can take and use us, each and every one of us, for your name's sake and for your glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And amen. I, I want to this morning revisit a message I, I preached four or five years ago that I entitled, He Shall Save His People from Their Sins. Now, Christmas, for the most part, has lost its innocency through worldliness, through commercialization, through uh, profit and everything that goes on. If people were actually celebrating the birth of our Lord, then churches would be full leading up to Christmas. But, you know what? The stores are fuller than the churches are leading up to Christmas. Instead, most people are simply celebrating the Christmas as a worldly holiday. It certainly bears the hearts of the religious people of today and identify who loves the Lord and puts Christ first. I'm not here to preach about that, although that could be preached again and again and again. But the biggest thing that offends me in the world that we live is the phrase, the reason for the season. Now, the reason for the season has many different answers that people give. But there's only one reason for the season. And as we celebrate the Lord, or the birth of the Lord and Savior, Jesus, we do well to reflect on why he was born. What is the reason for this season? 
Some say the reason for the season is, is to celebrate his birth, and I understand that. Some say that sinners are the reason for the season, and I don't agree with that, and I, I understand that. It was love that brought the Lord down from heaven to be born in a manger and to be bound to the old rugged cross. And then the world says that Santa and tinsel and presents and all these different things are the reason for the season. This thought I reject completely. Amen. It is not the reason for the season. The world says Christmas trees are the reason for the season. And presents, this I reject. That is not the reason for the season. We do celebrate and we do have presents because they brought Jesus presents. I, I think that's perfectly fine. You'd have a hard time convincing me any other way. But that's not the reason for the season. I think we find the reason for the season listed in Scripture. The Bible tells us in verse 21, if you want to look at it there. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And here it is. For he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. That's the reason of the season. It's not wholly about his birth, though we celebrate his birth. But it's the reason for his birth. He shall save his people from their sins. I, I, I just want to look at this phrase this morning and, and if you will, take it apart and, and see what we see in the wording of this statement. Now most of the time we read, we read from left to right. I'm going to take it apart from right to left as we think about it. Sin. The Bible says he shall save people from their sin. Notice it says sins in this. Now we know in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, or mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou shalt eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. God said this is how sin comes into the world. It is disobeying God's command. That's what we see in the world today. We see it in churches. We see it in everything that is going on, everything that is said and done. It happens all the time. Satan tells us in Genesis 3 and verse 4, Thou shalt surely, thou shalt not surely die. Listen. Uh, I, he's busy in this world telling lies. He tells lies to people all the time. Oh, don't listen to that guy. You, you can live how you want and get your prayers answered. That's the way we live our life. God's not going to chasten you. He's a God of love. God's not going to let you go to hell. He's a God of love. Listen, it's not God's choice. It's yours. Because the Bible says He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But you know how God answered Satan? In verse or chapter number 5, I'm not going to look at each and every one of Genesis. If you go back and look at it, eight times in that passage, the Bible says, and he died. 
That's kind of an exclamation point, if you will, to what God said would happen. God didn't intend for anyone ever to die. But that happened. Think about that. God said, you shall die if you eat. And they did. Satan said, ain't going to happen. And it did happen. I want you to also consider, and I started to hit this a second ago, it says their sins. Not only does God just say, now normally... When we talk about the penalty of sin, we talk about sin singular, right? Okay, sin singular is dealing with your sin nature and whether you go to heaven and hell. But I think God puts sins here because not only does He deal with that sin singular, but He deals with the power of sin in a Christian's life. He not only delivers us from the penalty of sin, which is hell, but He delivers us from the power of sin if we let Him. And so, we think of Him coming and dying on the cross just so we can go to heaven. And that's true. But He did much more than that. I mean, think about it. He delivered us from the power of sin so we can have victory and, and live in victory in this life. Amen. I mean, that's tremendous. I, I, in the Christian world... We have gotten so narrow-minded about Christmas. And I'm not talking about the worldly aspect. I'm talking about the spiritual aspect. We think, yes, He came so we can go to heaven. But what about this life here you live now? You're, you're talking about something in the distant future. Doesn't it affect you now? It should. Why? Because He died for your sins. Remember, when, when the New Testament, when it's dealing with sins, it's talking about how you live your life, the sins you commit after you're saved. He died for our sins, the power of sin. Then the, the word right in front of it, there. Oh, I praise God for this. Romans 5 to 11 says, Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom, by whom we have now received atonement. Now, it, it's talking about, notice the, the pronouns used here, we. We. There's pluralness in this statement, in this world. You think about this. He was a propitiation not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, He came, every person in this world, from the vilest, wickedest person, He came to save, and not only giving them a home in heaven, but to give them victory in life. Amen. There. You say, but I don't seem to be getting victory. What's your problem? Jesus gave you the victory. Right. Right. He's given you everything you need to have that victory. The problem is us. 
The problem is us. We've gotten so narrow-minded in our thinking of heaven. We're thinking, and even if I say this, of the resurrection and thinking about Easter Sunday. We've gotten so narrow-minded in our thinking as Christians that we look at it as a, a ticket to heaven when it's much more than that. Their sin. From. From. Jeremiah says in chapter 7, 10 through 11, And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. In this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. He didn't save us so we can go live like the world. He didn't come to die on the cross of Calvary and to pay our sin debt to go live like the heathen. He delivered us from our sin, not to sin. We've gotten so narrow-minded in our, in our thinking of, of this thing. We, we think like, hey, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I can do and act and say what I want and be what I want and, and, and do the things I want. You missed it. The truth of the matter is you probably missed salvation too. God came to save us from their sins. If you're going away from something, you're automatically doing what? Going to something. Guess what repentance is? Repentance is turning from sin, wait, to God. It's from sin to God. Not from this sin to this sin. You know, a lot of times that's what we do. We will trade this sin for this sin. Or that sin. No, God saved us from our sin to go toward Him. To draw closer to Him. Not to be in our sin. You know, that's the reality of 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away, and behold, all things are become new. I, I, I seen where a preacher said, no, it's talking about uh, what the new is, is talking about a new covenant. No. He's taking this verse out of context. Matter of fact, he says, people like me take it out of context. If you go back and study it, the context teaches what I, the way I've been teaching it. Not about uh, taking us from the old covenant to the new. Listen, if you think that, then you don't think they've been saved by faith in the Old Testament. And we don't need Hebrews 11. God give us Hebrews chapter 11 to let us know that they were saved by faith back in the Old Testament just as they are in the New. By faith. Lives are changed forever because of Calvary. His people, His people, Galatians 3.26 says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That is His people. We put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 1 and 2, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world.
He came for His people. He knew there would be people who would trust Him by faith. There would, he knew that there would be people who, who would follow Him and love Him. But they could not get there, get to heaven, without Him. That sin penalty still had to be paid for. And He died on the cross of Calvary to pay that sin penalty. He came to live so He could pay that sin penalty. And we need Him to pay that sin penalty. His people, next word, shall, or save, excuse me. Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him. Amen? Amen? Seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's able to save them to the uttermost. Uh, my preacher used to say, He saved me from the guttermost to the uttermost. That's what He did for us. He's able to lift us up out of the, the pit and, and the ditch of sin and the mire of sin and put our feet on a path to life everlasting. He's the only one that can do it. I, I know the world says, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and do it. Yeah, you might do it for a little while, but you're going to fail. And you're going to fail miserably. Because the Bible still says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. The world's philosophy and the world's way of doing anything is completely contrary to what God's Word says. You know, uh, the way the world tries to de deal with a lot of what they call diseases... You know, a lot of things that they call diseases, God calls sin. It's not a disease, it's sin. But the way the world says it is, listen, you just got low self-esteem. Lift yourself up. You can't do it. You're going to fall. You know, that's one thing I find strange about it. The world's philosophy says, oh, there'll be times that you fall, and that's okay. No, it's not. It's a sin. God's way, there's no fall. The world's way, listen, you'll be back again and again and again doing the same things. God saved us not only from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin. He saves us, as the Bible says, to the uttermost. It, it, if you keep going back to it, then you're saying He didn't save you from the uttermost. He can't do it. He can. It's all about what you want. The Bible lays everything out in a clear path. We just need to be able to follow. Amen. He saves. Shall. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, he, the Bible doesn't say, may be saved. As it says in the previous verses, if you turn to God with your heart... He will save you. Amen. Settled, done, finished. Amen. And listen, when He does, He gives you all the tools that you need. Right. The problem is, think of it like this, and I'm going to relate it the way I relate it the best because I was a mechanic for 22 years. Think of going to try to fix a car with no tools. You can't get it done. 
Listen, I've got all the tools I need. But if I don't use them, I can't do the job. You cannot say, I don't have the tools, because He's given us all the tools we need. Amen. You can, listen, you can read about the tools, but if you don't utilize the tools. And I'm not talking about just reading, but he tells us what to do. It's, it's kind of like, since we're, we're talking about Christmas, it's kind of like getting up on Christmas morning and the kids opening their uh, present and, and it's got this funny black and white thing in it. I've got all your attention. You're like, what in the world is this funny black and white thing? It's called an instruction manual. <laughs> Where it says put A at B, hold it together with one, because they usually have a representation of a number for the list of screws and nuts and all this, and, and put it together here and here. But, you know, hey, pff, we don't need it. A <laughs> couple hours later, honey, did you throw that paper away yet? Has the trash went out? <laughs> I can't figure this thing out. Guess what? We have the instruction manual. It says, do this. Don't do this. You know, the problem is, sometimes we read the instruction manual and we reject it. Listen, I, I, I've seen mechanics before. They get the paper and tell them how to do something. They have it there. They, they, I've seen them read it, then ignore it and mess a part up. A friend of mine on a Cummings diesel, when you put the piston assembly together, it, it comes in several pieces. It's not like a car where the skirt and everything's made on it. They're two-piece piston. And you read, and you need to make sure you put it together right because if you don't, you're going to have a noise in your motor. And this friend of mine, we had a, a job of rebuilding a motor and he was doing it. He put it together. He put the new sleeves in. I mean, it did a, a wonderful, clean, what should have been a great job. Except he failed to pay heed to the instructions on how, which direction to put the skirt on the piston. Right. Right. Fired it up. It had a little, what we call, piston slap. You could hear a little knocking. Some people, if you don't know what you're listening to, you might think you got a rod knocking. Took it back. The company called back, said, something's wrong with this motor. Listen, they just spent a lot of money to have that thing rebuilt. And here, one piston, he put the skirt on wrong. And guess what? That's not an easy fix. You got to pull the, the top end of the motor back apart, pull the bottom end apart, take that piston out, fix it, put it back in. It's basically almost a complete rebuild again. Why? Because he failed to heed the instructions. He'd been a mechanic he, for a long time. Pretty good mechanic. But it only takes one time of not heeding the instructions to get yourself in trouble. Right, amen. And listen, if you reject it altogether, guess what? You can never get out of your trouble. Right. He said, I shall do this. He did save them, 
But remember, He saved them from their sins. Not just the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. Oh, they, granted, there's people that are saved and going to heaven, but they're still under the power of sin because they won't heed to the instructions. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then the he. The he. Isaiah 43.11 says, I, even I, am the Lord. And besides me, there is no other Savior. I'm going to apply this in, just like I've been known all the way through this in two different ways. He is the one who will save you from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin, of course, is hell. He saves you and gives you a home in heaven. But listen, He is the one who can deliver you from the power of sin. See, he, he didn't just come as a baby and, and was lived and died just so you could go to heaven. He came that you could have victory in this life. And this is the victory, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's given us the opportunity... And I'm going to say it that way, to have that victory. Listen, salvation, I'm, I'm dealing with it as if it was past that you have it settled. It's done. If you're there, you can have victory over all sin. And listen, it's not through your power. It's not through your ability. It's not through you picking yourself up by the bootstraps. It's not about your self-esteem. Self, you know, self-esteem is just another way of saying pride. The Bible says pride cometh before destruction. I just read, if, you, if you're doing your Proverbs reading by the day, then you read today. Seven things God hate or as an abomination. A proud look is one of them. Amen. Amen. You think about that. How can we have victory in this life? Submitting to God. Amen. Time and time again we're told to submit to God. But you know, we've bought into this secular reasoning. I can do it. We think more of ourselves than what we should. I can handle it. No, you can't. That's why you're in the mess you're in. We need to submit to God. Amen. Let Him. I remember the phrase, I think it was at a, um, they was using it at a VBS several years ago. And, and I, I may even preach a message on it. But it goes, let go and let God. Amen. Amen. That's what we need to do. We need to get our focus back on the reason for the season. Amen. It's not just so we can go to heaven. But it's so we can have victory in our lives. Amen. I, I, I want to, and, and I feel I'm being led right now to do this. I, I want to make our theme for 2016, Victory in Jesus. Amen. Amen. He wants to give us 
that victory. We can have that victory. But it's up to us. It's all in what you want for yourself. Do you want to let God? Listen, you can keep hold of your life if you want. But don't complain to God about when it crumbles. It's up to you. God's not going to make you. Listen, even as children of God, God will not make you. He wants you to serve Him. But there ought to be something. Listen. If you rebel against Him as a child of God, there ought to be something there telling you you're wrong. You're wrong. If there's nothing telling you you're wrong, then I would look at the first aspect first. Are you truly saved? Because the Holy Spirit is supposed to convict us of what? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And listen, unlike you, God will always do His job. Unlike me, God will always do His job. None of us are perfect here. But we serve a perfect God. We have a perfect Savior. He came, was born, and lived and died. So we might have that victory. Where are you at this morning? How have you been looking at the birth of Christ? Have you fallen into that trap of thinking it's just about going to heaven? He came to live so he could die so I can go to heaven. Oh no. Your God's little. God the Bible did a whole lot more than just that. He came to die for your sins to give you victory. Are you living in victory today? Do you know for sure if you died today you'd go to heaven? Are you saved and you're not having any victory in your life? You just need to realize He gave you everything you need to have that victory in your life. But do you want it? I promise you this, if the Holy Spirit is inside of you, He wants it. He doesn't want you to live defeated. He don't want you to live... Listen, He don't want you to live depressed. I've... He said to the disciples, I have come that ye may have life and that ye may have it more abundantly. Notice He says, may have. That's up to you. That's your choice. Because he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, dear Lord, that uh, even in this precious time, as we look and think about your birth. Dear God, help us to continue to realize more and more each day that it wasn't just about you coming so we can go to heaven. It was, it was far more than that, dear Lord. It was a part of it, but far more than that. I pray, dear Lord, that you'd help us to search ourselves, that we could realize the true reason for the season. 
that you came to give us more life and to give it more abundantly. I pray, dear God, that you would have your will in this time of invitation. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. With every head bowed and every